Since then we started working on module 7, which is about structural level parallelism. Um, we talked about the concept of pipelining. Uh, we talked about how many stages we can have in the mixed process of pipelining. We have five stages, fetch, decode, execution, memory, and write back. And uh, we have some analytical analysis on how much improvement we expect to get if a pipeline is perfectly balanced and what is going to happen if it's not balanced. And we got familiar with how every step of the pipeline will work and some of these notations that is important for us because especially today we're going to continue this and you can see how we do some detections, dependency detections based on these uh, information that we have here. Um, but until this point, and this is something that I want to uh, emphasize one more time, we have, and this is important because we're going to keep building uh, the MIPS data path based on these types of requirements that we have in a pipeline processor. So this was an example of, maybe we can show it again one more time. This was an example of the load board, and we uh, talked about different stages and what happens in every stage, pipeline stage. But then when we got to the right back stage, we mentioned that such architecture can have a problem. And the problem is that uh, in a pipeline processor, when we are in one stage, for example, stage right back, for one instruction, other instructions are already sent to the pipeline. So when we are running one instruction like load board here, there are check there can be another instruction at this stage, another instruction at that stage, and another instruction at the stage which is decoding here. So now if you want to write something back to the register file, because we already have another instruction in the decoding stage, the address of the register that we want to write to is not the address for the instruction at the write back stage, but it's the address for the instruction in the decoding stage, which is going to cause a problem for us. So it's three instructions after the instruction that we're working on. So this is what <coughs> we identified as a problem, and we mentioned that then the way to fix this problem is we send this address that we want to write back to to the pipeline as well. We have the pipeline registers, as you can see here, and the address, instead of sending the address directly to the register, we send the address to the pipeline, and then it goes through the pipeline with the instruction. So now when you want to write back to the register file, the address is also the same address that we need for that instruction. Okay? So moving forward, we have to do a lot of these modifications to the pipeline processor for that to work in a, in a way that we want it to work, okay? So today you might get familiar with some of them, and next session we're going to continue working on that. Something I want to mention is, uh, one more time, I keep updating the PowerPoint uh, that is on the blackboard, so if you downloaded the one from last session, the one I'm presenting today is a little bit different, and the one I'm going to present next session is going to be different too, because the day before the class, I go over that and see if I want to add or remove something based on our discussions. Okay, so it's good to have them, I just uploaded for you to have it, but when we're done with the module, I'm not going to go back and change it, but I want you to re-download the PowerPoint when the entire module is done. So this is going to be different from the one that you uh, at that session. Um, yeah, so we got another example of the school word. I don't want to go back to it. The most important thing was this is an example that we don't use the entire pipeline. Store word doesn't have the right backstage, but because the pipeline is always designed for the worst case situation, because we don't know what kind of instruction we want to execute on the processor, we always have to go through every step. So in this step, we actually pass the data from uh, memwb register to, uh, to register file, although we don't really need to do any write back. Okay, so the timing is there. We're going to consume that amount of time in that stage, no matter what. 
Okay, so this is where we stop. This was an example of um, five instructions that we want to run in a five-stage pipeline. So these instructions don't have any dependencies, so maybe that's a good time. That's a, that's a good time to get familiar with this concept. Brendan asked a question last time, and this was a and I, I asked I mentioned that I'm going to talk about it next session, and this is the session that I'm going to talk about uh, that problem. There are situations that instructions have dependencies, and if there is a dependency, we can send the instruction one after another in every clock cycle. Okay, we should somehow fix that dependency problem. We're going to learn about the dependency a little bit more today, but these instructions that you can see here, they don't have any dependencies. You are reading something from the memory, you are moving it to register 10, you are subtracting two registers 2 and 3, putting the result in 11, you know, we are adding 3 and 4, putting the result in 12, no dependencies. And loading something from the space place in the memory, adding two other registers, putting in 14, no dependencies, right? So all of these instructions can be done independently, and they can actually be reordered because they don't have any dependencies, right? It doesn't matter if you run the add first or the subtraction first, for example, in this case. So this is a very simple case, and because there is no dependency, in every clock cycle we can send the instruction to the pipeline, okay? And what it means is, this is how we actually you show the diagram, but you have to have this in mind that we don't actually have multiple hardware, okay? So this is the same hardware, but with this diagram, what we're showing is that when load board is using the register file and reading the register, we're fetching the subtraction instruction. Okay. This is instruction memory. Another thing that we need to emphasize one more time, we talked about it a little bit, is the highlighting that you can see here. When we highlight the right side of the block, it means we are reading something from it. If we highlight the left side, it means that we're writing something to it. For this kind of pipeline uh, diagram, we show two register files, although we have only one register file. Okay, so this is how we show it, but it's fine because inside the register we are using flip-flop circuits, and flip-flops allows us to um, read data from them at the same time, in the same clock that we are writing something to them. So it means that the registers can be used in the same clock cycle to be read from and to write to. Okay, and that's why we have two register files. And as long as we have this working this way, when we're reading from it, we are writing something to it, it should be fine. And something that you need to know, we always write first and then read from it. So this is important because it gives us some extra capabilities that we're going to talk about today as well. So if we have a sequence of instructions like this, that they don't have any dependencies, uh, in we get the ideal situation for pipeline. In a five stage pipeline, we're hoping that at some point we can fully utilize the pipeline. And by that, we mean that every stage of the pipeline is actually involved in executing, fetching, decoding, reading the memory. One of these steps for one instruction. Okay. If you look at clock five, for example, here, clock five is when we are actually completely using the pipeline. So when load board here is here, you can see this instruction. When load board, we are having the right back stage for load board, which is our first instruction, or instruction N. This is instruction N plus one, instruction the second one. We have the subtraction happening in the memory stage. We have the execution, taking care of the addition process. Then we are uh, decoding the instruction for the load board here. And then we're fetching the instruction for the last end. Okay, this is the ideal case for pipeline because every every stage of the pipeline is involved in some part of instruction execution. Okay. So any questions so far before we move forward? Good. Okay, so so far when we look at this diagram, the first thing we changed was uh, what we do with the destination register, right? We just talked about in the case of load work, we have to send it to the pipeline. In this type of architecture that you're seeing here, we are not even talking about the control signals, 
right? We mentioned, we talked about the control unit, the entire question that you had about what should be every instruction, what should be every signal was about how the control unit works. But now we need to talk about the control signals here as well, as well okay? Uh, so what do we do with control signals? This is a data path, this is an architecture that uh, shows all the control signals as well. Okay. So based on some information that we have about the MIPS processor, we make some design choices. One of the most important design choices is, where do we want to place the control unit? At what stage the control unit should be placed? We have five stages, we have registers for every five stage. This is an important design choice, and it does have its own trade-offs. Okay, so we talk about some of the trade-offs now. Something that is really important for me, and the questions that you're gonna get from this module, is mostly on um, having a vision about how we work with this computer architecture, how we modify this, com this architecture to handle different instructions, okay? So it is very important for me to don't think that there's only one correct way of doing what we're doing here. Like there are many different ways that you can implement and handle these control signals. When I ask a question, probably next session we're gonna try it. I'm gonna give you a little bit more time and I want you to do some, to do some design, right? So I give you two instructions, for example, and I say, okay, so what should we change in the pipeline? Or what should we add to this kind of architecture such that the sequence of instructions can work without any problems, without any hazards? So we'll talk about the concept of hazards later too. So for that reason, when I talk about the design choices here, don't, don't try to memorize that this is the right way of doing it. This is one way of doing it. And also think about the trade-offs if you do it in, a, in another way, all right? So now let's go back to the control unit. The design choice of when we, where we wanna place the control unit. We know that MIPS processors uh, in the two stages, the two first stages for MIPS processor are the same for every instruction. We fetch the instruction, we do the decoding and register read anyway, no matter what kind of instruction you're dealing with. Okay, so that means that we probably don't need to don't need to set any control signals in the first two stages. But they are doing the same exact thing. That said, if we go back to a, an architecture that is not pipeline, so here's slide 24. Let's go back to slide one. So if you look at this one, we actually do see a multiplexer here. Okay, so the register destination signal is actually activating a path for this multiplexer based on which one of which field is gonna show, is gonna be, it's gonna include the address for the right register, okay? So we have a multiplexer here. If we wanted to simply follow this architecture, we actually have to have, have to have a multiplexer there. But now if we go back to there, if we just have this in mind, we have the multiplexer that choose the right register address. Now if we go to where we were before, this multiplexer is actually moved to the execution stage. Okay. So let's talk about it a little bit. And this gives you some idea about the other design choices that they Just in this example, we can get a better idea about why we do such, we make such design, such design choices. Okay, so we could still have the we know that because of this pipeline issue, because of what we talked about, the load word case, we have to move the address through the pipeline. That we know. Okay. We still could have the multiplexer here and move the signal through the pipeline too. Right? Because one thing that you can always tell is that, yeah, you're moving the multiplexer, 
because same thing that we do with the address, we want to do it with the signal that the controls the address as well, right? We want to write the register, we want to have the destination later. Okay? That's true, but it doesn't mean that you have to move the multiplexer from there. Okay? Uh, you could have just have the multiplexer there and send the signal through the pipeline. So why don't we do this? One of the reasons that we're moving the multiplexer to execution stage from my point of view, and this is not something that is talked about in the book, is that if we have a multiplexer here, we might have to move the control unit to the decoding stage as well. So by pushing the multiplexer to the execution stage, it allows us to handle the signal for this one in this stage and not here. If we wanted to handle the signal for this multiplexer at this stage, we had to move the control unit in this stage before that. Okay, so if you want, first of all, you can't even do it because you don't have access to the decoding. This is where we have access to the decoding. But even if you could somehow do it, because there are designs that they can do the decoding earlier, they push the decoding to early stages, and I might talk about it. Even if you move it there, you are moving a lot of signals from one pipeline to another pipeline for no reason, right? It means that you have to add a lot of, you see these blocks that are added to every stage? These are registers, these are overheads, these are data transfers, you know? So we don't want to have unnecessary data transfer overhead. We don't want to add some registers here to handle the signal. So if we move the control unit to this pipeline before, it means that now we have nine extra bits here to handle. And on top of that, we have to handle some extra bits here as well. This is exactly for, for the same reason we don't move the multiplexer to the memory stage or the write back stage. Because in theory, we could do that too, right? You could have had multiplexer here and it wouldn't cause any problems or you could have a multiplexer in the right back stage, and you still didn't have any problems. The problem would be transferring these two five-bit information of the address from one stage to another stage, and then to another stage, and to another stage for no reason. Okay, so you move the multiplexer to the execution stage. Right here, you make a choice, and the output is gonna be five bits. Based on the control unit, you choose a destination register, then you pass it through the pipeline, but then you're passing five bits, not 10, not 10 bits. So would it be wrong to have a multiplexer here? No. Is it efficient to have a multiplexer there? No. So the best place to have a multiplexer to choose the destination, the register destination would be in this place, right? So I don't want, so why am I, emphasizing this much on this multiplexer is because I want you to know how the pipeline works and what are the trade-offs that we have here. Okay, so this is how a control unit works. We put the control unit in decoding, this is the part, and now let's go back to the architecture and talk about every changes that we have to make to make the pipeline MIPS work. We have a control unit here that's supposed to control different plugs. Fetch and decode the stage doesn't need any control signals. Now, it doesn't need any because we move the register multiplexer to the execution stage. Now, what control signals do we need to use in the execution stage? One of them is the ALU source. Okay. We send the opcode to the control unit. We generate nine signals, we know this. Uh, nine bits of information, actually eight signals. ALU OP has two bits. And then we use it in different states. So we use ALU source here to choose the second source for the ALU. So one of the signals is used in this part, in this stage. Another one is the ALU OP, which has two bits. ALU OP and the function. The function is the input of the ALU control. And the ALU OP is going to choose what kind of instruction we want to execute in the ALU. If it's a branch, it's going to be subtraction. If it's R type, can be AND, OR, ADD, whatever. The other signal that we need here is the register destination because we are handling the register destination at this stage. <coughs> so right here, we are using four bits out of the nine bits. 
four bits out of the nine bits, one for ALU source, one for ALU OP, one for ALU transmission, and two for ALU OP is being used here. So this, these are the signals that we don't need to send to the next stage of the pipeline, okay? That they are used in the execution stage. The signals that we need to send to the next stage are the branch signal. This is where we handle the branch, but the reason we handle the branch here and not here, oh, can you tell me why we're using branch here? Why do we actually have to use the branch here? It's not a design choice. Why do we have to use the branch here? Because branch after executing some instructions. That's right. So we only take the branch. If you remember, this AND gate, one of the inputs of this AND gate is the zero flag. So we do the subtraction based on the flag, we take the branch or we don't take the branch. Okay. So this execution should be done in this stage. The result is stored in this pipeline, and then we get the result out of the pipeline, and we end that with the branch signal, and from there we take the PC source decision. Where should the next instruction be? Is it an instruction after this instruction, or we have to jump to the branch target address? Okay, so branch target address is also calculated here, but it's not sent back until the memory stage. So both of these signals, the, the result of the branch target address, and whether we take the branch or not, which is the PC source, the result of the AND operation here, is happening in the memory stage. So another signal that we're using in the memory stage is branch. And obviously we have the memory write and memory read as well. So three other signals are used at this stage. We have four signals, four bits used in the first in the execution stage, three bits used in the memory stage. So what do we have in the write back stage? In the write back stage we have sorry, we have the mem to reg decision, whether the content that we want to write back to the register file is coming from memory or is coming from the ALU. So this is the decision that we need to take in the write uh, back stage. Plus the register write. Do we want to write something to the register or not? So there are other two bits that we use here. So we use four bits or three signals in the execution stage. We use three signals or three bits in the memory stage, and we use two bits in the write back stage. Okay? The reason we put the control unit here is because we do the decoding at this stage, and to define the control signals, we need to first have the result of decoding. But that is based on the opcode. All the control signals are defined based on the opcode. And the reason that we moved this multiplexer to the execution stage was, first of all, we had the control signals after the execution. The control signals are already at this point. And then we want it to be efficient. We don't want to move extra five bits in every stage. Although multiplexer could be shown here or here. OK? Does that make sense? If it doesn't, you can go and watch the YouTube video after this, we can upload it. And then probably the more we talk about it, the better you understand uh, how it works. So one more time, this is the summary of what we discussed in instruction fetch and instruction decoding stages. We don't have any control signals. We don't have to set anything. In the ALU operation, we, or execution stage, we use the signals register destination. ALU OP and ALU source. Register destination is the only signal that didn't have to be here. It was here because of the efficiency. We have the memory access. Memory access uh, stage involves the branch decision, branch signal, which uses the AND gate plus the zero flag. And then we have the mem read and mem write. And then write back, we have the mem reg, mem to reg, and register write. This is the summary of what I already discussed. Okay? And these are how many bits we have to add to the pipeline registers. So we have to add nine bits here, which makes it a total of 142 bits. If you go back to the slides, we keep adding to the register files. We have to add another uh, five bits here and two bits to this one. So we have 69, now we get 71. 
Okay, so keep adding registers, flip flops to these registers. That'd be fun. All right. So with that in mind, this is the time to talk about the concept of hazards. Okay. So hazard, as you can see, based on the definition here, is a situation in which the next instruction cannot execute in the following clock cycle. So there is some sort of maybe dependency in case of the data path, data hazard, or some structural issues that we can run the next instruction. For any reason, it doesn't matter. We're going to talk about the uh, reasons now, the type of hazard that we can get. But if we can't run the next cycle, right there we have a hazard. So we can have structural hazards, data hazards, and control hazards. Okay. So structural hazards happen if we have a kind of architecture, we have a processor that cannot execute two consecutive instructions because of some limitations in the architecture. This doesn't really happen in MIPS for a simple reason that we have two different memories. We have an instruction memory and a data memory. Okay. Now let's assume that a designer made a design choice to not use two separate memory blocks for instruction and memory, and then see what's going to happen. So this is the case that we don't have two different memories. We show the memory here, but it's exactly the same memory. One of them is supposed to be used for instruction, the other one is supposed to be used for data. Okay, Not two different memories, it's just how we show it here. So if we have a load instruction, and just ignore whatever we have after that, it doesn't really matter. If we have a load instruction at the beginning, in clock four, we want to use the memory to read the data from. Okay. And three instructions after that, when we want to fetch an instruction, we want to read the same exact memory, but not to read the data from, to read the instruction from. Okay. So right there you get a structural hazard because your hardware doesn't support that. You don't get these problems in MIPS because they have two separate memories called instruction and data memory. Okay? At least the cache, at the cache level we have two different, like in the first layer cache, we talk about it later, in the first layer cache we have instruction memory and data memory, and in the next layers we don't, we have everything is combined. Okay? We're going to thoroughly talk about this kind of how the memory architecture works in module uh, 8. But for now, because we have two separate memories, we never get the structural hazards in MIPS, so we don't really talk about it. Okay? So that's the end of the uh, story for structural hazard. That's the only thing you need to know. Now, the most important topic of this module probably is data hazards and how we handle data hazards. Um, so data hazards happen when there's a dependency. Okay. So what do we mean by dependency? Let's have this example in mind. We are adding T0 and T1, and put the result in the register as zero. But then in the next instruction, we're subtracting T3 from S0, and put the result in T2. So this S0 depends on the result of this addition. Okay, so now if we have a pipeline uh, MIPS, at the end of the fifth stage, we write the result back to register S0, right? But in the third stage of the second instruction, we need to know what S0 is. So if you look at the timing, we have the data written back to register S0 after a thousand nanoseconds, let's say. Okay. What we need to have the result of S0 at this point is 600 nanoseconds. We can't go back in time, and then it's going to be a problem, right? We don't have, simply we don't have the data ready. What if we go ahead with this one, the S0 that we're using here, is not updated yet, so it's just some number that we had before. So this is the data hazard. It's going to work. It's not going to cause any structural problems, but it's simply going to get the wrong number. Okay. So how can we fix a problem like this? 
like the most basic way of fixing a problem like this. So you here. just stall the next instruction? You just stall it. And stalling means we just don't we have a bunch of no operations. Okay, but how many stalls do we have to do here? If you stall it once, for one clock cycle, then this is going to move forward one stage. And execution is going to be here, but still we're going to get the result at the end of the memory stage. We still don't have it for the input of the execution. So it means that we have to stall it for two clock cycles. Okay. We stall it for two clock cycles. This is the most basic way of fixing this problem. Actually, if you have two stalls within every instruction, you're never going to get any data hazards. Why? Because the first two stages are always fetch and decoding, and we can't have any dependencies there. Okay, fetch and decoding, no dependencies. We're just fetching something and decoding it. When it gets to the execution stage, that's exactly the first possible stage that we can have a problem. So if you have two stalls between two instructions, then you always have the result written back to the register when you want to go to the execution stage. Perfect, right? So that fixes all the problems that we have. We're not going to have any data hazards. A very simple situation, a nice way of fixing it. So now let's do some analysis and see what is the consequence of such solution. If we want to look at the speed up of the pipelining, speed up for pipelining, we can simply use the inverse relation that we have for speed up. We can get the time for a pipeline processor and the time for on pipeline processor. And if we divide the time for on pipeline processor by the time for the pipeline processor, we're going to get the speed up. Okay? So if you want, we can rewrite this equation between space and CPI and clock cycle time. So on pipeline processor execution time is equal to the CPI of on pipeline divided by the CPI of the pipeline processor multiplied by the clock cycle of the on pipeline processor divided by the clock cycle of the pipeline. Makes sense, right? Okay, so now the ideal CPI for a pipeline processor is one. So we are hoping that we can get, we can execute one instruction in each clock cycle. Okay, this is something that we talked about. We have an initial latency, and after that point, we keep getting one instruction in every clock cycle. That's the ideal situation for us. CPI of one is what we're looking for. Now, if we add the stalls, if we add these bubbles, we have to add the number of stalls we add to the system to the CPI. So if we want to add two stalls after each instruction, our CPI would be one, which is the ideal CPI, plus the number of stalls. Right? So let's see how that works. Speed of equation. I want to see how it's going to affect our system. This is the speed of equation. For a single cycle, non pipeline processor, CPI is also one. That's always one. It's a single cycle <coughs> processor. We run one instruction in one clock cycle. Always one. It's not pipeline, CPI is equal to one. The CPI of the pipeline processor, though, is one plus pipeline stall cycles per instruction. This is what's established here. Then if you multiply this by the clock cycle of the unpipeline divided by the clock cycle of pipeline, this is the equation that we get. Okay. Okay. Now, we know that the clock cycle of the pipeline, if the pipeline stages are perfectly balanced, is equal to the clock cycle of the unpipeline architecture divided by the pipeline depth, right? This is something that we had before, we talked before. With the pipeline, the five stage pipeline, we're hoping to get five times improvement. We mentioned that if it's not balanced, you might get four times improvement in, the, in this example that we had last session. So we're familiar with that. There's another lesson to learn here. The CPI is not really going to change in a pipeline processor and on pipeline processor in an ideal case. CPI is one in a single cycle processor, and we're hoping to get a CPI of one in a pipeline processor. The thing that we're improving is the clock cycle time. Right? 
So if you have a pipeline processor, you can significantly increase the clock cycle time because your critical path is decreased. Right? The critical path of the longest time it takes to get the output when we apply the input. Because you reduce the critical path by adding the registers. So if it was a VLSI design course, I would go deep into what the critical path is. But like every time we have two registers, the longest path from one register to another register is the critical path of that design. Because that critical path is reduced, because we add these registers, the clock cycle can go higher. Clock cycle can have faster clock cycles because they take less time to finish. So CPI is not changing. Okay, that's a common mistake that people make because they think low, the lower CPI, the better it is, but it doesn't really happen in this case. Now, just for the fun of it, I want to ask a question. We talked about CPI of less than one. If the pipeline processor doesn't give me a CPI of less than one, what can give me a CPI of less than one? CPI of less than one I can mean is I can run more than one instruction. Instruction is in one clock cycle. Just just to go with that. If you use like parallelism? If you use parallelism, but not instruction level parallelism, what we're gonna talk about in module nine, if we actually had two ALUs. If we had multiple cores, right? Just for the fun. Forget about it, I'm gonna talk about it later. But Okay, so the clock cycle pipeline is going to be clock cycle on pipeline divided by the pipeline path. Okay? Fuck that, that, sorry. Okay, so now let's bring back the equation. This was the same equation in the previous module. If you replace the clock cycle pipeline with what we have here, this equation is going to change to this. 1 divided by 1 plus pipeline stall cycle construction multiplied by the pipeline depth. Okay. So, if there are no stalls, we don't have any stalls, and we have a perfectly balanced stage, stages in pipeline, with this, the pipeline stall clock cycle per construction is going to be zero, the pipeline depth is five, so we're going to get five times improvement. I just speed up five. But now, we talked about the data hazards. We talked about a solution that fixes the data hazard. And that solution was adding two stalls between every instruction. So what it means is the number of pipeline stall cycles per instruction is equal to two. So what is the maximum speed that we can get with a five-stage pipeline if I have a situation like this, if it's perfectly balanced? Can you do the math here? What is the maximum speed that I can get? What is the pipeline stall cycles per instruction? Two. Two. What is the pipeline depth? Five. Five divided by three is going to be one equal to 1.67. Okay? So this is the maximum speed up we can get if it is perfectly balanced. Okay, so if it was four, which can happen, we had an example that it wasn't perfectly balanced, and it ended up getting a four uh, times improvement, we would have a 1.33 uh, speed up, maximum speed up. So now we're going from five times improvement, four times improvement, to like 30% improvement. Okay, instead of having 500% improvement, we're getting 30% improvement. And that's the best case, right? That's the best case situation. Uh, well, not the best case, but one of the good cases. Uh, okay, so that, that's not good. We don't want to have that. Adding a stall is not something that we're looking for. Okay? It might not even work. All the overheads we're adding to the system, registers and so on, handling the control signals, all the modifications that we're making to the uh, architecture for 30% improvement. It's a big deal, but you can get way more improvement by easier things, right? So fortunately, there are better solutions than stalling. And that's not what people do 
in the modern computer architectures. We want to avoid the stalling as much as we can. So one of the most effective solutions for that problem is, is called forwarding or bypassing, depending on what textbook, what textbook you read. Forwarding or bypassing means that we add extra hardware to supply the input of the next instruction as soon as the ALU generates the result of the current instruction. So instead of waiting all the time to write it back to the register file, the moment that we have the results out of the execution stage, we just forward it to the next instruction. This is shown this way. Something that you need to pay attention to is that obviously we can always forward and we can never do backwarding. We cannot, we can't go back in time. So this is actually needed and this, this time is actually held. So this is the next instruction and we need this after 600 nanoseconds time uh, frame and this is going to be ready before that. So for example, if we have a load board situation, this was an app, right? If we had a load word situation, the load word data would be ready at the end of the memory stage, then we can't do the forwarding. Okay? So for cases like that, we might want to combine forwarding and installing. So instead of installing it for two clock cycles, you just install it for one clock cycle, and then you have the opportunity to forward it. So before you had to have two clock cycles here, we have one bubble, we have one install cycle, and then we can forward it from memory to execution. Does that make sense? How we can forward it, we're gonna talk about it uh, in more details, I think, probably today or in the next session. Now let's talk about this example. Okay. So this is an example that actually has some dependencies. We have a C co-segment, which is this, A equals plus B plus E, C equals B plus F. And now if you convert it to assembly, uh, everything, we just assume everything is in the memory. So if we load word uh, from memory, from this memory address, and put in the register T1, let's say this is just for B. Then we load the next value of the register T2, which is E. Then we add T1 and T2, put the result in T3. And then we store T3 back to the memory. Okay, so this is done now. The next step we have the load board, we load F. We don't need to load B again because we already did it here. So we load F this time and put it in T4. And then we add F plus B. T1 is here, put the result in T5, and store it back to the memory. Does that make sense? Okay, so what we want to do here is we want to find the hazards first, dependencies, what instructions are going to have issues here, and, and we want to see if we can use a method called reordering or scheduling to fix these problems, okay? Our assumption is that data path is equipped with forwarding or bypassing mechanism. So forwarding is already there. Um, now we want to see if we can fix this problem. Okay. The first thing we need to do, this can actually be a question in the exam, in the quiz, I can give you some sequence of instructions and this is exactly how I want you guys to solve it. I want you to create blocks like this, Five stage pipeline, and then identify the hazards and see if we can fix it or not, and so on. Okay? So, in order to solve this question, the first thing you need to do is you need to create this kind of diagram that you can see here. Okay? So, this is the first instruction, then when we're decoding the first instruction, we can fix the next instruction, and so on. Okay? So, now let's see if we can find the dependencies. The first instruction obviously doesn't have any dependency. We're just loading something to register T1. The second instruction, similar, we don't have any dependencies. We just read something from memory and put it into T2. Then we get to this point. 
we want to add T1 and T2 and put the result in T3. So we need T1 and T2 to be ready at this stage, right? So T1 and T2 should be ready here. Now, we do have forwarding. So we have to keep that in mind. The pipeline is equipped with pipeline forwarding. If I ask you, we don't have forwarding, that would have been a different scenario. Okay? But we do have forwarding here. So what it means is that we can look at the previous stages and we see if we do have the option to forward the data. Okay. So we need T1 and T2. Let's say T1 is here. T1 is ready at this stage. We're loading something from the memory. Okay. So T1 is ready here and we are fine. We can forward that. Okay. So it's ready at this stage. Execution is a stage after that. T2, though, is ready at this stage, and unfortunately, we can't forward it. Okay, so right there, we have a problem. This is the data hazard. This is where the data hazard happens. So, if I want, if I ask you to identify the data hazard, this is the instruction that has an issue. Okay, add. So, we found the first one. Let's go to the next one. When we go to the next one, we just assume, we just forget what the hazard was before this. Okay, we just move forward and we just look at the structure before that. Okay, so we want to store back T3 to a place in the memory. Okay, so T3 is going to be ready. So we, we, we need T3 here. We don't need T3 in the execution stage because here we're just adding T0 plus 12 times 4, right? So we don't need it in the execution stage. This is where we need it. This is where we want to store it to the register. To the, memory. T3 is ready here, so we can forward it. Good. Okay? So there's no hazards here. It's possible to forward. Then we have the load board instruction. Load board doesn't have any dependencies. We just go to the memory and bring the data to T4. Okay. So no dependencies there. How about the add instruction here? We need T4 and T1. Okay? But we need T4 and T1 at the execution stage. T1 is already ready here, so we don't have any problem with that. T1 is already written back in the register file, so we don't even need to do any forwarding. T4, though, is ready here. At the end of the load board, is actually at the memory part. We can't go back, we can't do forwarding, and another data hazard here. Okay, that's the next problem that we have. How about the store board? The store board, we have T5. T5 is ready at the end of the execution stage. So we need, we need T5 at this stage. This doesn't give me any answer. We don't need anything in the execution part. T5 is ready at the end of the execution stage. So we can forward it. Right? So we have two data hazards here. One for instruction number three. Another one for instruction number six. Okay. So now we want to be a little bit creative. Now we want to be the compiler. And that's what compiler does. Is there any way to fix the problem that we have here by reordering the instructions? Go in. Uh, just moving the load word and instruction five to be before the add so it shows everything. That's right. So to repeat one more time, we want to move the load board instruction that doesn't have any dependency to any other instructions, right? We're just moving the load board. It doesn't matter where we execute this one. If we move load board to here, so we do the three loads in the beginning, then we potentially fix the problem with the add here because then we, it's as if we stalled it with another instruction, right? We're actually executing an instruction, but we move everything forward one clock cycle, then we can do forwarding. But at the same time, we fix the problem for this add too because the load work happened a few cycles before that. Okay, so now let's see how it works. So if we do the reordering as Ian suggested, we have no dependencies here. Perfect, it's just loading something. 
Then we have addition. We need T1 and T2 here. T1 doesn't even need a forward. T1 is ready and written back to the register file. So we don't need to forward it, it's already ready. T2 though is ready at this stage, but it can be forwarded. Okay, so no problems. Then we go to store word. Store word T3 is ready at the execution stage. We need it at the memory stage. We can forward it as before. Yeah. Now we have the app. We need T1 and T4 at the execution stage. T1, we don't need the forwarding because it's already written back to the register file and it hasn't been changed since then. Then we have T4, which is also written back here. So we don't need any kind of forwarding for that add instruction. Both of the you know, values that we need, T1 and T4, are already written back to the register file and haven't changed since then. So we're good. Or forward. Store word, we need the data here, and it's ready at the end of the execution stage, so we can do forward. All the problems are fixed with reordering. Okay? So later in this module, we're going to get more complex questions from this. I'm going to add floating point instructions in. We have more site stalls and everything. But this is just the beginning of where we're going to go. So now, uh, let me see. Let me go forward a little bit. Yeah, we have a little bit of time, so let's talk about this too. Okay, so we have, so with that example, we know how the reordering work, we understand the data has and so on. So now let's have another example here. So we have this sequence of instruction. The reason I mentioned this example here, because from this point, we're going to use the sequence of instructions to explain different concepts. Okay, so it's very similar to what we had before, but this is going to be used for every other concept that you want to talk about uh, in the data hazard detection and so on. So this is the sequence of instruction we have here. Obviously, we have a subtraction in the very first step, and literally every instruction after that point depends on us, the register T. So there is dependency in every instruction after that. How it works is that we have a value of 10, let's say, assume that we have a value of 10 register T2. Before the subtraction, when we do the subtraction 1 minus 3, we get a value of negative 20. So it's 10 before the subtraction, negative 20 after the subtraction. Okay? So we want to see how the sequence of instruction would work in a pipeline processor that doesn't have forwarding or bypassing capabilities. No forwarding, it doesn't even have a stolen capability. So it's a very simple uh, pipeline processor. We want to see how the content of this register is going to change. So clock cycle one, this is the value of register two. In clock cycle one, we have 10. The subtraction is not executed. Nothing has changed in register two, so it's not going to change. Here we're fetching instruction, the subtraction instruction. Log cycle two, you're reading the register, the content of T2 is still uh, 10. Log cycle three, the execution is happening, but the content of register is not changing. It's still 10. Okay. So right here we see the first problem. In the second instruction, it's time to read register two but the content of the register two is a still 10. So the value that we're gonna read from register two it would be 10, but based on the instruction, you want it to be negative 20. So the and instruction here, it should use the register two from the subtraction. But when we read the register, we're gonna have an issue. We're gonna read the content value 10. We go to clause cycle four, we still have value 10 here, and then we have the second problem. The OR instruction wants to read 2. Because the content of this register hasn't changed yet, what we're going to get out of register 2 is 10, which is not what we want to work with. Right? In clock cycle 5, the value is going to change from 10 to negative, five, negative 20. 
Now it is written back. Okay, because there's no stalling, no pipeline, remember? Now it is written back. Now the value of register 2 is negative 2. Okay. We're good in this cycle because of the uh, special feature of register files. We can write to them in that clock cycle and read from them in the same clock cycle. So here you're going to actually use the negative 20. The first instruction actually uses the correct number is this instruction. After that point, we have the value of negative 20. It's not, it's not going to change. And obviously, this register is going to use the correct number as well. It's already negative 20. If you look at that, two instructions that actually use the desired values are the last two instructions. Okay. So now these types of this type of uh, data hazard that we just talked about happens in the execution stage. Okay, in that example, just this example. This happens in the execution stage for all of these cases because we want to do some kind of addition or add here also we want to do another addition. So all the hazards are happening in the execution stage. We're just executing the raw number. Okay. And they happen when we want to read the register after writing it in another instruction. So we're writing the register here and then we want to read that register. So this type of hazard is called read after write raw hazard, as we can see here, and it always happens in the execution stage. Okay. So now, these are, this is how we detect the hazard. So we're talking about the hazard, data hazard detection. The, so what we use to detect the hazard, we have a hazard detection unit somewhere in the architecture we talk about it later, right? But what we use to detect the hazard is the value or the values inside the pipeline registers. Okay. So now, all as I said, all of these uh, dependencies happen in the execution stage. One way that we can check whether we have a dependency or not is checking the addresses that we need from the registers. So if <coughs> the address that we need for register A or B, for the first operand or the second one, is equal to the destination address of the instruction before that, which is now in the execution memory stage, then right there we have a hazard. So with this two example, it would be easier. So this is instruction N in which we get an error. Okay, so this is RS, right? This register RS, the address, and if, if we go back to instruction encoding, the address for this register is stored in the field RS. Now, what we are reading is register IR, so this is where I said that we need to uh, get familiar with the terms that we use here. So this is register IR in the IDAX pipeline and the RS field in that register is giving me the address of register S0. Now this is instruction N. When I'm executing instruction N, instruction N minus 1 is in this pipeline. Right? So when I'm executing this instruction N here, the previous instruction is already in the next pipeline. So if I check the RD field in the execution memory pipeline, in the register IR in the execution memory pipeline, and if this RD, which is the destination register giving the address for this S0, is equal to the RS in the IDEX pipeline, then I have a dependency. So you want to know how hardware detects this problem? This is how it does it. It just checked the fields, and this IR, which is the machine code for the instruction, right? The machine code for the instruction is passed from one stage to the next stage to the next stage, and so on. So the pipelines, every pipeline register that we can see here, 
has the machine code for that instruction. So when I'm, instruction, when I'm running instruction N here, the machine code for instruction N is in N is an IDX pipeline. The machine code for instruction N minus one is in the execution of the memory pipeline. And the machine code for instruction N minus two is in the mem WB pipeline. Okay, because we already have the machine code there, we can compare different fields in, that, in those machine codes and detect the hazards that we can get. If the source in register N is equal to the destination in register N minus one, then we have a hazard. So now we can have two types of hazard, one A and one B. This is possibly a question that I can ask you. I can give you a sequence of instruction and tell, ask you what kind of hazard you're getting here. Is it 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, okay? And I don't even ask you to, is it 1A or 1B? You have to know it, okay? But now if you go back to it, you can see, okay, so the RS here is equal to RD here, and these are two instructions, the two consecutive instructions, N and N minus one, and the hazard that I'm getting in the execution stage of this one, so there's something happening in this IDEX pipeline, and if I check the RS address in the register IR of the IDEX pipeline and check the destination address in the mem IR in the, in the execution memory pipeline, if they're equal, we have a hazard. So this hazard here that you're seeing here is RS. It's one, sorry, it's one A. So how could I get one B? What should change in this instruction so I can so I get the one B hazard? If you swap T3 and S0 of the sub instruction. That's right. If you swap this two, then now RT is the S0. So it means that it doesn't matter what source. If either of these source registers have equal address as the RD of the instruction before that, we have to type one hazard, but it can be 1A or 1B based on the, the dependency being in the first source or the second source. So, the type two hazard that I can get is between instruction n and n minus two. Example is something like this. So it still happens in the execution stage. This is where I have a dependency. S zero in the IDEX pipeline, the source in the IDEX pipeline is equal to the destination in the mem wb pipeline. So again, there's a hardware that compares these guys and chooses what kind of hazard we have here. So you can see the RS for this source, for this instruction n, is equal to the RD in instruction n minus 2. Okay, this pipeline and this pipeline. We check the IDEX pipeline and memwe pipeline, we compare the source registers with destination register. If we swap these two, we're gonna get 2B. We get 2A hazard here, but if we swap these two, we get 2B. Why does it matter to detect hazards like this? It's because this is the information that the forwarding unit is gonna use to send the data to the execution stage. Depending on what kind of hazard you're getting, the forwarding unit activates a different path. I just do a flash forward here, and then we can probably. So this is, yeah, see, this is a forwarding unit that we have here. We're not going to talk about it today, but the forwarding unit actually gets this input. And then we are adding something to the multiplexers, and based on the hazards that we get, different paths are going to be activated. So it does matter if it's one A or one B, because we want to see should we forward it to the first source or the second source, right? So now let's go back, let's see what we have here. Okay, this is actually the last thing we talk about. So we have this example. Now we want to go back to the previous example and I want you to tell me what kind of hazard we're getting. 
Okay, this is the same example that we talked about. First instruction is add. This is the instruction and. It's actually and, not add, but it doesn't matter. Register 2, register 5, register 12. Can you tell me this dependency, this hazard that we're getting here? Is it 1A, 1B, 2A, or 2B? Raise your hand if you know the answer. Well, is it 1A? It is 1A, and why is that? Oh, um, because you're needing it in the, the earlier one, the earlier stage, and it's RS, not RT. Yes, so it's the first source that has a dependency to the destination of the instruction before that. So this is the case, execution memory, ID, AX. We can actually see the pipeline. This is the IDAX, this is where we, where we need data. The data is available in the execution memory here. Okay, so right there by comparing these two, we can find a dependency. And this leads to 1A, that's the first source. How about the second one? Or instruction. What kind of hazard we're getting here? Is it 1B? No. So, Xander, you have to find 2B. It's 2B. Why 2B? Because we, um, it's two instructions away, so it's in the memory right back stage now. That's right. So, the error we're getting is in the IDAX. The data is in the XMEM, in the MEMWB. So, IDAX, MEMWB, pipeline. We're going to get a 2B. And it's 2B because it's the second source, not the first source. If it was here, it would have been 2A. Okay? How about the third one? What kind of role? Uh, it seems you have. What is that? No hazard. No hazards. Don't get a hazard. And we don't get a hazard here. Okay. So that was it for today. Um, we're going to go over it.